there's no investigation that we fear. There's nothing that can uncover evidence against Jamie because there's none that exists. Snow Files, Season 2, Episode 25, Body of No Evidence, Q&A. The mission of the Snow Files podcast is to expose the misconduct of the state's attorney's office under Charles Renard. It is not our intention in any way to disparage the current state's attorney's office or the Bloomington Police Department. If you enjoy Snow Files, please give us a quick rating and review on Apple Podcasts. This will help Jamie's story get out to the masses. Visit snowfiles.net and click on Rate Show. And while you're there, leave us a voicemail that may be used on the show and check out our cool Snow Files merch. Thanks for joining us for this week's Q&A segment, where we dodge rabbit holes, slay inaccuracies, and untangle this web one fiber at a time. Let's get started. Let's start with a popular question about the case presented to us this week by our listener, Rebecca Porter. Rebecca writes, I'm so glad you're back. I wanted to give Jamie a hug after hearing how difficult it was in season one. I'm so hopeful for his case. About this episode specifically, I remember the big question around Bill Little's body position and the mystery presented on the Truth and Justice podcast. Am I forgetting where the explanation was presented as we heard it on this episode of Snow Files? Leslie, we're sure that you recall this episode well, because we all know you listened intently to the Truth and Justice podcast on Jamie's case. What do you recall about this episode? The episode Rebecca is referring to is episode 24, A Complete 180. In the episode, Bob describes a discrepancy between the crime scene photos and diagram and the two officers' recollection of the positioning of Bill's body when he was found. Basically, the officers both say they found Bill on his side in the fetal position, kind of laying on his chest behind the counter, facing the wall away from the door. And the first officer on the scene said he saw his shoe sticking out from the behind the counter. So Bob seemed to think that meant Bill was laying with his feet sticking out and his head inside the counter. And then postulates that if his feet were hanging out, he must have been standing near the counter gap when he was shot. And he thought maybe the perpetrator was behind the counter then and Bill was blocking his exit or confronting him. The crime scene photo showed Bill the other way, though, with his head all the way out of the counter into the store area, his hips in the gap and his feet pointing towards the back wall, not even behind the working area of the counter, kind of just in the pathway. So Bob rightfully surmises that the first officers didn't lie about where they found Bill. It just simply meant he was flipped by someone during life-saving measures. Although no one, not even the EMTs, not the forensic invest- investigator, would take responsibility for moving his body. Bob was concerned with this as it shows that the investigation was botched from the beginning. So, Leslie, as a listener, you were really hung up on this for a while. I think you honed in on the smaller discrepancies once they were presented. So I know you did some research into this last year. You actually spoke to Jeff Pilo about this himself, what he saw, who did what, and why the term 180 was used. You want to tell everyone what he told you? Yes, I do. Um, I was hung up on it because he gave a description in 1999 that he found Bill at more like a 90 degree angle difference than what the crime scene photos depicted with his feet towards the middle. And he said Williams was the one who moved him. He explicitly said that. But now when Bob reconstructed the scene based off statements, which were convoluted by the fact that confused investigators started arguing with Pilo during his interview over the difference between 90 degrees, 180, and 360 degrees. So Bob, in good faith, went with the 180 and made an episode called 180. 
So I did reach out to Pilo myself. I was kind of like, what the hell? This guy's still around. He's easily accessible. He's talked to Jamie's lawyer before. So let's just see if he'll talk to me. And he did. And he was, he has a very good memory of that night. Everything he says matches his reports very, very well after all this time. And he gave me more details than he gave to the investigators at the time. And I asked him literally, which way was he lying? Head towards the storeroom? What did you mean when he when you said he was flipped 180 degrees in the crime scene photos? And Pilo told me, quote, he was behind the counter, head to the south, face was looking towards the west, feet to the north. Door is on the south side of the store. Room is on the north. I mean, his body was moved. He was no longer behind the counter. 180 degrees is not accurate. That was either Katz or Barkas saying that during the March 2nd, 1999 interview. I stress he was moved by Williams from behind the counter and Williams cut open his shirt. This was a big do not do by BDP SOP. Okay, Leslie, but we really need to explain why this is so important to clarify. Well, what this means is that Bill was indeed actually behind the counter when he was shot. He wasn't found by Pilo and Williams with his feet sticking out from behind the counter gap into the store area. His shoe was just simply seen through the gap by Pilo as he was walking up on an angle. So maybe his foot was limp and hanging out of the side gap a bit, not like physically sticking out into the store like he was facing the store. Pilo never said once anything other than he saw one shoe. He wrote in his crime scene report that night, quote, I observed through the glass door a tennis shoe sticking out from behind the counter. During his 1999 interview, he said the same thing, a tennis shoe sticking out. During Susan's trial in 2000, he said the same thing, a foot sticking out from behind the counter. And at Jamie's trial in 2001, he told the prosecutor the same. He saw a shoe sticking out from behind the counter. So what I gather from talking to Pilo is that Bill was found completely behind the counter with his head near the register, one shoe visible from the bottom entrance of the counter, and then Williams arrived, wanted to initiate life-saving measures, rolled him on his back behind a very tight and short counter with a stool back there and a bunch of crap all over the walls and wanted to move him instinctually. And since a person wouldn't naturally drag an injured person by his feet, I think Williams must have grabbed him by the upper torso. He probably did so from under his armpits or maybe even from the front of his waist and then pivoted him around with his feet and legs possibly dragging and then dragged his torso out of the counter opening just to the point where his head and his chest were in the store area so he could work on him. This would leave him in the exact position crime scene photos shown lying. As Pilo said, it wasn't a 180 exactly. It was more than a 90, though, somewhere in the middle. His feet weren't replaced with his head. You know, it was that his feet kind of stayed in the same area at the end of the counter, but he he was pivoted. Like, imagine turning a clock hand counterclockwise from the seven o'clock position back to the three o'clock position. And that's it. And I know in this episode, we went with what William says that lifeline moved bill and quote, stretched him out. Um, But in my opinion, I think that a lot of this chaos happened because William didn't describe just how much he actually moved bill from the get go. And if Pilo insisted back then and is still insisting it today, I think Williams did move bill. And the reason this is so important and requires quite this explanation is because we can't say that based off where Bill's feet were laying when he was moved, that we can then backtrack these angles in all these different interviews later and say exactly where his feet used to be and then predict where he was going to walk towards right before he was shot. The facts show that he was behind the counter when he was shot. Yes, his feet were towards the end, but his entire body was behind the counter. And Pilo verified this again 30 years later to a T. Bill was not blocking the exit of the counter with his body. His legs and his feet were not hanging into the store. One shoe was just seen in the gap through the glass door. We therefore can't speculate on motive, either on behalf of the victim or the suspect. And that's why we need the clothing tested to confirm a possible struggle and motive for murder. If Williams 
move the body, then he, of course, he was alone. So he would have had to move him that way. And that's just one theory. If it was Williams that moved the body, if it was the EMTs, they would have had two people there to move him. So it wouldn't have been as difficult as it would have been for, for one person to move him. However, Williams did finally admit at trial that he did move the body. But again, it's ambiguous. It, you know, that's the frustrating part is that it's, it's very ambiguous. The EMTs in their report do not talk about moving the body and they did not testify. You know, so those are just some of the issues that we have in this case. And that's the point of the podcast. You know, that's what we've been trying to do this past year. Review the documents, the evidence, just the facts and present everything we say with raw data to back it up. I mean, it's fortunate that, that Pilo was willing to talk to us and, and clarify some of those, some of those issues. And I think it's really important that we stay focused this season and only talk about the facts, only about the forensics, what we know and what we want to know. I think that's the best way to tell the truth and get Jamie out. And as always, all of our documents are up online for you to see for yourself. And we would absolutely love your feedback on these issues as well. So we could just keep talking about the position of the body and who flipped them and why they flipped them and like where they grabbed them from and all this stuff. That's not really important. What's important is that now we have the first officer on scene giving a much more detail that still lines with all of his recorded documents saying where the body was when he first came in. And he's saying it was behind the counter in the fetal position and his head was south, his feet were north. And so now that just clarifies where he was lying when he was shot, since we don't have any pictures or any diagrams or anything that are accurate. So that's just the take home from that whole segment we just did. So now we know where he was. And the other takeaway is that Let's get back to the to the basics here. The reason we're focusing on Pilo is he was the first one to see the body. You know, that's it. Right. Pilo exactly. was in there and he was in there alone. So he was the first one to see the body. And that's that's why, you know, it's 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 also important to understand what Pilo saw when he walked in as compared to what William saw when he walked in. And then, you know, what the pictures say which are different. So that's, you know, that's the point of that. Just to um, clarify, going back on what Tam said, um, small discrepancies can really work to create false narratives. So I think we're seeing that here. And what Tam said about sticking to the facts in season two, I think is really important. I mean, Jamie's been upfront about this from the beginning. The truth is his best hope. There's no investigation that we fear. There's nothing that can uncover evidence against Jamie because there's none that exists. So we want to test all the DNA, hide nothing, seek the truth. But I really think we should stick 100% to the facts. And if we do, that's the best chance for Jamie's freedom. But the discussion is so fun. That's the cool part about it, because everybody comes to it from a different angle. And that's how we learn. You know, it's okay if we disagree. We love These these cases take so many years, too, though, that sometimes these little little discrepancies, little false you know, clues here and there, they eventually become facts in somebody's mind because we're talking about decades and they're not facts. It's just a fiction. I think we have to try to work through that because when we're dealing with a case like Jamie's, it takes so many years to unravel. Some of these little things, they eventually just become facts. They've been said so many times. You say the wrong, you know, you lie so many times over and over and over again, it becomes the truth. And I think we, we fight that a little bit. That's, that's absolutely true. That's just why we're trying to be so careful about the way that we present everything. Hey, y'all. My name is Maggie Freeling. I'm a journalist and producer, and I'm the host of Unjust and Unsolved. And I want to tell you about my new podcast, Murder in Alliance, a real-time investigation into a case that is so bonkers it's hard to wrap your head around. Everyone in this town seems to have some kind of secret or interest in this victim, whether it be drugs, sex, or both. I'll be teaming up with Jason Baldwin from the West Memphis Three and his organization, Proclaim Justice, to reinvestigate this murder from the ground 
in Ohio. If he slit her throat right here, there would be more blood on that on that sofa. We track down witnesses. You guys have got to understand what's at risk for me here. And even uncover massive police corruption. There were two officers that felt like their brotherhood, their staff, that could have been involved. This is the case of David Thorne and the murder of Yvonne Lane. Find and follow Murder and Alliance wherever you get your podcasts. Bruce, we did have a listener question for you, actually. This might be our first one, and it's a good one. Ellen Olson No was asking about if you knew of the connection you have to Jim Clemente. Jim is an ex-FBI profiler who has his own series of podcasts, and he works with Bob on Truth and Justice, and he did help him profile the suspect in Jamie's case. Ellen noticed that Jim gave you a shout out on his own Real Crime Profile podcast back in 2016 on episode 40, The Murder of Meredith Kircher, and recommended listeners go to injusticeinperugia.org, which is your website. She was so stoked to realize how everything has come full circle with the podcast she listens to. What do you think about that? Can you tell us about the work you did on the case? Ellen wants to know what you think of Jim Clemente, too. And if you knew he was aware of your work. Well, first off, Ellen, thank you for listening to the Snow Files podcast. And thank you for the question. I want to make it clear, I don't know Jim Clemente personally. Uh, When we were working on the Amanda Knox case, I worked directly with another retired FBI agent named Steve Moore. The Amanda Knox case created a worldwide frenzy. The media was all over this case, which made it easier for groups like ours to bring together teams of experts to investigate. We had incredible experts that came forward to look at this case. We can only wish to be able to bring this kind of attention to every case we work on. The Amanda Knox and Raphael Salichito case changed my life uh, personally forever. It opened my eyes to wrongful convictions, and I've been working on these cases ever since. Uh, Steve Moore, uh, the FBI agent we work with directly, he played an integral role on the Knox case. Not only did he present her case to the public in a way that left no doubt in her innocence, he was on every major news network around the world talking about this case, and he presented the case in a way that people that aren't necessarily experts could understand it. Um, So we were just so grateful to have him there. Experts like him and Jim Clemente and so many other people came forward on this case. I can't name them all, and I'd leave somebody out if I did, and I'd feel bad about it. But... Steve Moore even provided the security for Amanda when she left Italy after her acquittal. So, I mean, we really had, uh, we played a close role in this case, which really brought me into the whole wrongful conviction world. And I'm kind of happy that it happened because here we are now talking about Jamie's case. But when it comes to Steve and Jim, they worked on several projects together and they had their own set of skills with the Knox case. Steve wrote a series of articles for us dissecting the crime scene and Jim was more of a profiler, so he was able to really look in depth in everybody's you know, personalities. And he really brought out a lot of great things about Amanda's case. So we're grateful for Jim's work. Um, but like I said, I don't know Jim personally. I admire his work, and we were happy to have him on board for the Knox case. I know he's gone on to work on many other projects now. And you can catch Steve Moore. Uh, he does work on CNN. So they're both still very active in Uh, working on uh, wrongful convictions, so we're happy to have them both. Want to support our fight to free Jamie Snow? There are several ways to help. You can join our Patreon for $5 a month. All patrons will receive a free wristband and a shout-out on the podcast from Jamie Snow. You can also donate through PayPal or even buy us a cup of coffee. Visit snowfiles.net and click on Donate. Sam, in this episode, we talked about the body, what the crime scene responders saw, and how the scene was investigated. But there was forensic evidence collected from the body after Bill arrived at the morgue. Can you talk about what the crime scene investigators took from the scene that night and what was collected from the body later? Yes. So there was blood taken from the floor. The bullets were collected from the body. There were shoe electrostatic shoe prints taken, and there were fingerprints, all of which we'll get into detail in in subsequent episodes. There was a lot that wasn't taken from the crime scene that night. 
there doesn't seem to be any any indication that they took shoe prints from behind the counter, printed the cash register and the alarm button. But as Jamie says, we know there are two items that were taken from the crime scene that positively belong to the killer. And those are the bullets extracted from the body. Also, what left with Bill Little was his clothing. The shirt that was cut off of him was never tested, but it was taken and it was all collected. The other issue is that we can maybe discuss the time of death. So in Pilo's conversation with Leslie, he said he did not see discoloration in Bill's skin. But Williams did report discoloration and also the EMTs did. So how long does it take for lividity to set in? Could they have backtracked the timing? That's something we can flesh out in the future, I think. The state would have you believe that Bill was shot while Pilo was across the street watching Danny Martinez's car supposedly backfire and that he let someone escape. So every minute counts in this scenario. And unfortunately, those are the things that were never examined. Also, what we've really pinpointed here is who had access to the body by looking deeply into these documents and and kind of mapping that out a little bit, which is why we started from the beginning instead of just throwing a bunch of science at you. We want to look at who had access to the body because that could be important when they do test the clothes. So we can exclude the first responders and we have their names. We can exclude um, Pilo. We can exclude Williams. And then if there's some other DNA on that shirt, then, you know, maybe that could be something that we could identify because there may have been a struggle. Thank you so much for listening. This has been a great Q&A and we appreciate you listening. We love your feedback. You are welcome to post on any of our social media, any questions, any thoughts, any feedback. We do have this, leave a, leave a voicemail. You can go straight to our website, snowfiles.net, and there's a little tab on the side of it. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer, and you can leave us a quick voicemail, and it may be used in uh, snowfiles.net. So we appreciate you listening. And we're going to get deeper into the body of evidence in the next episode. All right. And don't forget that next month we have a court date coming up for Jamie. And um, we should actually hear from the prosecutor's office this time. You know, if they read the documents and if they're, you know, ready to go forward with negotiating some kind of decision on this. We invite any witness featured on the Snow Files podcast to come on the show to give their point of view or to clarify anything that they think might have been misstated.